All right. Check, check. Check, check. Checking? It's okay.
So some welcome words for you uh, to be on on uh, on board. Uh, maybe it's one of the first ever photonic events in Vasa history. <laughs> Uh, and it shouldn't be the last, for sure not. So some few words about why this was organized, where we are heading, and then we leave the floor for Eric to tell you some facts and realities about his field of work in, in photonics. But first, what's the uh, short little background? I just... Um, most of you, for sure, understands that light has certain properties which are fantastic. The light is moving 300,000 kilometers per second without needing any energy at all. You, you just need energy to stop it. <laughs> uh, and uh, then the light has the property of wave and particle, and you can use both <laughs> amazingly. And as a result, as you will see in the leaflet, I didn't put now to go through them, there is a tremendous breakthrough in, in all fields of science using light uh, properties to speed up everything, not by the factor of uh, 10. The factor is minimum 100, but the potential is up to 1 million times faster, more efficient, energy saving as compared with the, what we have today. Uh, and now, the reason why we started this. First of all, Vasa is known as the center for energy cluster in the whole of Northern Europe, right? In that field, uh, all kind of data, all kind of uh, monitoring, all kind of uh, uh, AI-based data collection will need, first of all, photonics. We need photonics to have space data. <laughs> uh, and we need to, to understand the, the potential of it and so on. So uh, that's the brutal reason to start understanding. So Eric has been meeting with ABB, uh, not, not Eric, but Photonics Finland been meeting with ABB today in the morning. and. Um, uh, that said means that uh, this is an occasion where we start a process of for sure integrating knowledge about photonics into the existing, but for sure we will also start integrating photonics into new uh, businesses for young people. Uh, we have started Kvartken Sat, not we only know mainly university, but we have been part of the innovation center in, in, in the process. Uh, there is highly needed uh, photonic understanding, but we have also other kind of sensor applications now. Uh, one of them is a muon detector on show here, uh, where we use light uh, effects to understand if it is a muon particle or some other particle moving through the air. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, example of how things can be made small compared with a classic technology which need a lot. But this was said for you just to state, we will not leave this room unless we have decided how to move on, right? And with these words, welcome Eric. You have the right now to tell these people what you know and to get them to continue to use that knowledge. Welcome, Eric. All right. What I'm going to do is, is walk you through probably around 46 years worth of uh, fiber sensors in an hour, which will be interesting. And the topic of, I think you have it on the other side. Is it? I think it's on the other side. Yeah. So the title of this talk is Fire and Ice. And the reason for that is we have extreme environments that oftentimes are, are, are very challenging where we have applications that need to have incredible sensing capability. And fiber sensors actually allow us to do that. So I will roll through some of the, uh, the possibilities. 
Okay. All right, the first question is, why bother? And I'll go through uh, some examples of why it's important to use uh, fiber sensors for various applications. And the next question is, what can we sense? Go through that. And there's two different types of, inter of uh, fiber sensor classes that I'm going to go through. On Friday, I'm going to talk about the Sidenac interferometer, which is used to guide almost all commercial aircraft, as well as military aircraft all the rovers on Mars and so on. So we'll talk about that and some derivative applications which include curtain voltage sensing. The entire company is set up to do that and some other kinds of sensing. But here we're going to talk mainly about fiber grating sensors as a vehicle to just convey what the technology can do. There are many other kinds of, of fiber sensors and I'll allude to some of them as we go through this. But the examples are all fiber grating sensors that I've been involved with uh, projects on. And basically doing things that uh, nobody else has been able to do before. So why do that? Well, I worked for McDonnell Douglas from 1977 to 93. And the primary application was aerospace. We also did a lot of oil and gas. But this is representative of the first project I had, which essentially involved a Delta rocket, which launched all the GPS first and second generation satellites, um, the Mars rovers, all sorts of different uh, space probes, roughly 100 launches. And the issue was they needed a new type of guidance system uh, as opposed to mechanical gyros, uh, which are where they were currently using. And it turns out that the guidance control people had come up with a solution that was based on mechanical gyros that was, instead of ch being charged a million and a half dollars, it was half a million dollars, and they did not want to be displaced by an optical gyro. So they funded a small program, and I came up with a way of basically having a closed loop fiber optic gyro, which became potentially viable for this application. And 45 years later, a lot of rockets, satellites, and other things are being uh, guided by that technology. The type of program I'm going to be talking about today uh, involves using fiber gratings for health monitoring in a lot of cases, or flight control, or other functions. In this particular case, this is a Delta Clipper. This is the precursor to the uh, Falcon 9 and the SpaceX uh, rockets, which are reusable. It's also the precursor to what Jeff Bezos has been doing, and the Chinese are trying to do the same sort of thing at the moment. But on this rocket, you have a conformal hydrogen tank, and you have an oxygen tank. And the issue was, you want to have cheap access to space. So this was done for the Strategic Defense Initiative, which required cheap ac access to space to be practical in order for the whole system to work. So the idea here is the shuttle took 20,000 people per launch to support it. A large rocket like the Titan rocket was more like about three or 400 people. And the Volkswagen of rocket launches was this Delta II that took 200 people. The idea here was to have three people in a trailer, just like an airplane, and be able to fly it, land it, refuel it, fly it again. In order to do that with something like a hydrogen tank, if the hydrogen tank leaks, you've got a big problem. The thing will probably blow up on you. So that program actually succeeded. They built this third scale um, model and it flew all its missions for the Air Force under this program. And NASA, which was very skeptical could be done, actually funded more flights. And on this, there are uh, fiber grating sensors to measure both strain and temperature, essentially there to detect cracks or failures. And initially, the people who were funding this, well, not funding this program, the people in charge of this program, because it was commercial, there was no government involvement is one of the requirements by McDonnell Douglas. No NASA reviews, no Air Force reviews. They didn't want to see any government people whatsoever in the entire program. And they did it on time and on budget and very successfully. But in any case, 
the program managers wanted to, technical program managers wanted to use electrical sensors on this only, not fiber optics. But we had a very large fiber sensor award from DARPA. There was political pressure to put them on. They reluctantly did and put it on electrical sensors. After the flight tests, every single electrical sensor failed. 100% failure rate. 100% success rate with the fiber grading sensors. So the same people that were saying at the beginning of the program, we're not going to use fiber sensors at the end of the program was, we'll never use an electrical stream gauge on a hydrogen tank again. And that actually happened. They had other programs later. Then there's things like space stations. Uh, McDonnell Douglas had the original contract for a space station before it moved over to Boeing and eventually the two companies merged. But you have things like lightweight struts, you have docking maneuvers, and the idea was if you're going to make space platforms lighter and lighter, flimsier and flimsier, you'd like to be able to know is crack, is crack occurring in strut number 17A or something like that? Is the whole thing going to fly apart the next time you do a docking maneuver? So you want to be able to do health monitoring on the structure if a micrometeorite hits the habitat area or a laboratory, maybe you could do some self-healing where you automatically detect the location and severity of the, the hit, and then you do a self-seeding maneuver. Whoops. Then you have issues like this, where somebody decides to launch uh, the Challenger, even though it's not a good idea, something goes wrong, and basically that's it. The whole thing blows up and you kill the entire crew. Well, if you can react fast enough, if you know what's going on, you potentially can avoid some of these catastrophic failures. But you have to know very quickly, you have to react very quickly. The initial shuttle launches actually had lots of electrical sensors. There was one small problem. You couldn't have a payload because the sensors weighed too much. The electrical sensors are heavy, and by the time you get to the point where you instrumented the entire shuttle, no room for a payload. So they took all the sensors off and flew it without sensors. But in the fiber sensor case, you can have thousands and thousands of sensors that weigh very little, so you have the possibility of doing uh, widespread instrumentation. Same thing with aircraft. Uh, there was a, this is an MD-11, there's a DC-10, where the service maintenance people really messed up and didn't attach uh, an engine after they uh, did some maintenance on it properly. And it took off from O'Hare Airport in Chicago and one of the engines fell off. Well, this plane can actually fly with two of the three engines, take off with uh, two of the three. But if you're the pilot sitting in the front and you have no idea that your engine fell off, flight control laws change and they crashed it. Whereas basically if you could have an automatic system that could tell you, okay, your engine fell off, the flight control laws change, they would have been all right. So there's many possibilities of what you can do if you can make decisions and react fast enough. So in general, you have the potential of having fiber optic sensors on a lot of these platforms, critical aerospace platforms, and you have something occurring environmentally, and you sense that, you take that information, you go back to an optical uh, processor, initially the signal is in optical form, you convert it to electrical form, maybe do some pre-processing, and then you go off and you change the, maybe the flight laws, you have a damage assessment, maybe the vehicle needs maintenance, so you may, uh, essentially do the servicing before it's catastrophic. So you also have, in some cases, maybe you have a fighter airplane and you want to have a ultimate performance, so, but you don't want to essentially have the plane fall apart. So all those things are related. So where have these been used? Well, initially, a lot of these things came out of aerospace. And the reason is the aerospace people are often pushing the envelope of what can be done. 
especially people who are trying to access space or in the military, you push the aircraft literally to the limits. And you want to have an advantage relative to anything else. So you, you, really, um, you really push the technology as far as it will go. And you don't care that much about cost initially. You want to have a performance edge. Probably the next, well, the next thing that came along in a strong way was oil and gas. And the reason for the oil and gas um, interest was if they could improve the safety of their wells and not replicate something like BP oil having a gigantic spill in the Gulf and being fined about $10 billion, you'd like to avoid that if you're an oil company. You also have the potential well, if you, you have, have an oil platform that's costing $2 million a day, a day and then you can pump more oil from that oil platform, it, it makes a lot of economic sense. So the oil and gas company uh, came on secondly, if you like, not far behind the aerospace industry. But, but then later you had the civil structure people for things like bridges, dams, things that are uh, critical infrastructure you'd like to be able to monitor so you don't have bridges collapsing and causing problems you'd like to maintain and, and fix the problem before it becomes a, a big problem. Maybe you want to monitor traffic. On the dam, you'd like to make sure the dam is constructed properly and not going to fail on you and flood out who knows how many people behind the dam. There's things like electrical transmission. So from the um, electric power point of view, do you have transmission of power? Do you We've had problems in California and Oregon where you have transmission lines actually starting fires. You'd like to know if there's a problem along the transmission line, where it is, how bad it is, and take corrective action before you start a big forest fire. You also have, uh, in the energy sector, you have nuclear power plant monitoring with fiber sensors. You have hydro uh, turbines, things like that. Green energy um, situations, windmills, a lot of these, uh, these spring measurements are made actually on blades on a, a lot of these, these mills. Um, I also touched a little bit on medical. There's things like robotic surgery I'll talk about a little bit. But there's also things like measuring pressure um, during brain surgery. The fibers essentially allow you to isolate the patient electrically. You're not going to electrocute the patient. And there's many, many different sensors being developed for the biomedical uh, application area. And we can sense just about everything. And I can go through some of these as we, we march along. Interestingly enough, the first um, fiber strain sensors were interferometric. They were not uh, fiber bearings, which I'll talk about later. This is a mid-1980s strain sensor based on the cyanide interferometer. It's configured, uh, so we're measuring changes in the length of this coil. We have a micrometer stage. You're pulling two parts of that apart, and then you're measuring parts per million of, of length change. And we were interested in that because we wanted to see how well we can do, and you can see this is not exactly a straight line. And part of the problem is you have a coating on top of the optical fiber. So if you start embedding these fibers into composites, you can have some issues associated with fibers slipping and so on. So what we've done, what we started to do is after we did that demonstration, the people in the commercial aircraft uh, area got very interested. We started building composite structures. This is a small coupon. There were 12 fiber sensors running through it. And we wanted to see, did it change the structural integrity of the part? And how well did it measure strain? So this was the first effort where you had an epoxy acrylate coating over the fiber. And the problem is the interface between the glass fiber and the epoxy acrylate, it would slip. And even though you had relatively good adhesion to the composite, you didn't get an accurate strain transfer. And the structures people did not like this eye pattern where you had extra glue, because this, this thing is going through many, many cycles. 
aircraft are taking off and landing and so on and flexing, could this possibly be uh, an area where you have a failure? It turns out you, if you make the fiber small enough and you use the right kind of coating, like using a polyimide coated fiber in a thermoplastic composite material, you no longer have the interface. It's essentially the coating and the surrounding material are the same composition. They flow into each other. You've got a perfect interface and nice strain transfer. And if you make the fiber diameter small enough, you can show that they do not degrade or change the performance of the composite part. Then uh, the more ambitious aircraft people got a hold of it and decided they wanted to put this in titanium metal matrix materials. Now this is where things get a little bit hot. This is processed at 1,000 degrees C and 1,000 pounds pressure. And what happens is if you do not have the appropriate coating on the optical fiber, you will get little pieces of residual artwork glass left because the hot reactive titanium will just chew right through your optical fiber. But if you coat it with aluminum, the titanium interacts with the aluminum. You have a titanium-aluminum barrier, and the fiber remains intact. And you can do the same thing with beryllium, some other coatings that were investigated. So there's a wide range of materials you can embed these things into. Now I'm going to start talking about, well, how do you actually make strain, pressure, temperature measurements? And this is one class of sensors that in the late 80s was introduced. And what you have here is an optical fiber, which is roughly hair thin. It's, it, the large ones are 125 microns, but others range from 70, 80 microns or even, even smaller. And if you illuminate the core, which is usually doped with germanium, to give this a higher index of refraction than the surrounding area, so the light is trapped, if you like, in the core region, you can induce a variation in the index of refraction periodically down this core. And we're talking about maybe five millimeters and thousands of small perturbations in the index of refraction along its length. Now, it turns out if you illuminate this kind of fiber, you send light shooting down the middle of this core. What happens is the light rattles around, and the reflected light is very narrow. It has a very narrow peak that depends upon this period of the index of refraction. So it's kind of like an accordion. That period gets longer or shorter if you stretch the fiber or compress it. And if you heat it up, it gets longer. And if you cool it down, it gets shorter. So it's measuring both strain and temperature, and they're intermixed. And one of the issues is how do you separate those two out? So you're measuring one parameter and not two. So this is basically just showing you, OK, it gets longer or shorter, and the wavelength changes. And if you send the signal from the thing you're sensing in a roadway or a bridge or dam or whatever you're going to do, the light comes back. And if you send it through a filter where the light intensity is going to change as a function of wavelength and you ratio it with something that is just a, a, a baseline calibration, that gives you essentially very rapid um, readouts. So this is 1995. It's looking at a very simple system. Here's the fiber grating. It changes wavelength. It goes to a thing called an overcoupled beam splitter, which basically means as the wavelength changes, the light goes in one direction or the other very rapidly. So you can use that to measure strain changes very fast, essentially the speed of your detector. However fast your detector is, that's how fast you can measure it. There's a setup in 1995 where you have a couple detectors and a light source, and this goes out to a composite uh, utility pole. DARPA actually funded us to look at uh, um, fiberglass utility poles, but they wanted to know what's the structural integrity. And this was done with a company in St. Louis, which was a spinoff from McDonnell Douglas and people I knew. And they used a forklift to basically bend this pole. And uh, an interesting story, 
you you had to put a safety thing here otherwise you have like a slingshot and you would throw the uh, this little forklift into the wall but in any case they pull it so you had catastrophic failure and there were in embedded fiber gratings in the junction area and you could measure essentially what was happening as it essentially exploded on you. Then with the Oregon Department of Transportation, we started to do bridges. So this is a bridge uh, over the Horsetail Falls Creek and it, it's in the area that's the number one natural tourist area from Oregon and they were concerned that this 100 year old bridge might fall apart, a tourist bus would go across and they'd find it in the bottom of the creek. So in order to reinforce the bridge, they were looking at doing a composite overwrap over the, the beams. So the Oregon Department of Transportation funded this. We coordinated with Oregon State University. We built, well, Oregon State built full-scale beams, the same size as the bridge beams, and we put 60 sensors on it and, and tested something like five beams all the way to failure to verify that this composite overwrap uh, technology worked. Um, basically, the technology overwrap had a fiber sensor embedded in it. You'd cut a groove and put the fiber sensor, another fiber sensor right underneath it in the concrete. You compare the motion of the two, and there were 28 sets of these things measuring shear strain at an angle and uh, tension and compression on the bottom of the each beam. So we ran this for two years on and off, and people were liking to do the tests because you go out to the gorge for a good chunk of the day, and you'd have these dump trucks empty, half full, and full, parked at various positions on the bridge to look at the deformation of the bridge due to different loadings, due to seasons, and then they declared it good for another 100 years. But Rather than abandon things, we convinced them that, well, we ought to show you you can measure, measure traffic on this bridge with just one sensor on the, bottom of the br on the bottom of the beam. And here you see a minivan, an SUV, and a small car. So you can weigh the vehicle basically by the deflection of the beam. And that's what these peaks are. You can tell how fast they're going by the full width half max. So the wider this is at the half power point, the slower it's going. This one's going faster, so it's narrower. So you get how fast they're going as well as the, uh, the weight. They wanted us to get a motorcycle, but a jogger came by. So here's a jogger running on the bridge. We asked him to jump up and down, and here he is walking off the bridge. So you could monitor the foot traffic on the bridge as well. And that's 1998 or 99 or something like that. Nowadays, we can measure a small dog if we wanted to. So the next level up is, okay, you can do that. What about freeways? We want to monitor the truck traffic on our freeways. And we happen to be nearby the, this Interstate 84 that runs from Portland, Oregon to Boston. And after doing some tests on uh, test pads of asphalt and concrete, we showed that basically you can measure vehicle axles and, and weight. And we installed a series of sensors on the freeway, so I'm gonna quickly go through this. That's the position from a building down the street along a bicycle path to the freeway. So there's cutting a groove in the street in front of our house. And we put the cable into the the road along a bicycle path. You can see some of the vehicles lining up to close part of the freeway. And uh, here you have a diamond cutter cutting grooves in the cement about seven and a half centimeters deep. And we're putting fiber sensors Essentially, they're gratings that are stretched, pre-stretched. So, and they're anchored in the concrete. 
and when the vehicle goes across it, it stretches this tube, and the gridding stretches longer or shorter. We measure that, and we can tell what's going on. That's just uh, sealing the, the grooves and the junction box. It actually supports 12 sensors because we're looking at instrumenting the bridge over the, by the uh, freeway as well as uh, doing more things in the freeway later. There's the position of the uh, sensors in the freeway. And this is what they really wanted to measure. There's all sorts of different types of trucks that roll over the freeway. They wanted to know what type of, of uh, truck it was so they could characterize whether the uh, double trailers or the triple trailers were causing problems or freeway damage. So you see the two wheels in the front, the three wheels in the back. Here are two sensors. There's space, so you can tell on the displacement how fast they're going by basically traditional type of just velocity and time. But you also can see the front two wheels and the back three wheels. And the spacing will indicate uniquely, okay, what kind of uh, truck is it or trailer is it? To show that it had greater sensitivity, here's an example of a small car. It is not going over the sensors directly. It's in the adjacent lane. So you actually have strain transmission from the adjacent lane over to the lane that has the sensors in it. You can see the front wheels and the back wheels. Next thing we did with bridges was um, a new type of bridge where you had composite beams holding up the bridge. This is with UC San Diego. And it's sponsored by Caltrans, which is the California Department of Transportation. So here's the composite beam. And we put several sensors that were roughly 15 centimeters long along the base of this composite beam. That's what the modelers at UC San Diego wanted. And what they're looking at is what happens if you have a damage to that composite beam? Can these sensors actually detect the damage before it becomes a catastrophic problem? So they induce damage by essentially a, uh, a gigantic saw uh, tool, and they change the damage state. And what that does is, it simulating traffic, it changes the modes of vibration. So you can see visually that as the damage state changes, the amplitude of the, um, the mode changes. But if you look down here, and this might be a little small, each of these modes has a different characteristic frequency. And so by monitoring the frequency, you can back out the damage state of the bridge. Then we moved on to steel bridges. And this just shows you a setup. The National Science Foundation sponsored this. So we have a light source, a broadband light source, and a tunable etalon that essentially allows us to sweep frequencies. So if you put fiber gratings in a row, each with a characteristic wavelength, you can scan those out and tell what their strain state is. We have another leg going through a hydrogen cyanide cell, and this is more spectroscopy, but basically the light goes through the hydrogen cyanide cell, and it has known spectral content. These are fixed wavelengths that are known, so you can calibrate back the sweeping action of your system and make sure it's calibrated and that your strain measurements are accurate. The other feature that we incorporated into this is not only can you measure the sweeping the gratings and there'd be many lines. So you have eight fiber lines and you have five or six sensors. So you have 40 sensors. You can also adjust the tunable light source to the edge of one of these gratings. So if this moves by a small amount back and forth in wavelength, it will scoot up and down that steep slope. So here's a an iron 
beam basically the steel beam actually in the lab and you have five grading sensors on the beam and we're looking at bringing out this uh, readout system and if you park on one of those gratings you have a very interesting sensor if you drop a washer that's five millimeters in diameter one millimeter thick from 10 centimeters height that's the signal you get so you're looking at small fractions of a microstrain which is an Essentially, if you have a meter long length, it would be uh, one millionth of that length, but we're talking about even shorter lengths. So it's a very, very, very small change, and you're getting this huge signal. Okay, next thing we did is we, for the Navy, we looked at uh, ultrasonic um, responses. So if you have a fiber grating and you have ultrasonic waves through, in this case, it's aluminum, you have the ultrasonic waves hitting your grating, and in this case, it depends on the orientation, because if the wavelength of the uh, ultrasonic wave is a fraction of the grating, you're gonna get interference, it'll damp out the signal, whereas if you go in this direction, it goes over the entire length of the fiber, you'll get a stronger signal. So you get something like this. Well, in the medical community, people have thought, well, you know, we can actually embed these fiber grating sensors into organs or tissue and use external ultrasonic uh, signals and see how it affects the propagation through the organ. And uh, anyway, that has been done mainly with animal studies. There's another example. Um, here we're going to be looking at extreme environments for pressure and temperature. And by extreme, I mean looking at things like rocket propellant or ex, uh, energetic materials um, and checking out what they can do. Now, there are two different types of fiber gratings I'm going to be showing you. One is, the again, the uniform type where you have a change in index refraction along the length of the core gives you a fairly narrow signal coming out. The second type of fiber grating that we'll be going through really quickly is a chirp fiber grating. Now this is very interesting because it allows you to measure position and velocity very fast. So each segment along here the period gets longer and longer and longer and longer as you go along the length here. And what that does for you is that you have a wavelength band and each segment here corresponds to a, speci a specific wavelength and a specific position. So if you take a broadband light source and illuminate this type of chirp fiber grating, what will happen is you get an output that looks similar to this. This is the light source. This is the grating output. looks fairly flat over that wavelength band. And we did this with Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So the first thing wa they wanted to do was calibrate it. So they took out... Um, a laser and basically cut off 30 micron chunks all the way across this grating, which I think was roughly well, 34 millimeters in this case. And what you have is if you illuminate this grating as you're cutting off the ends, you get power that is dissipating as a function of the length of the grating. And you can plot that out and get a fairly linear function of position versus the remaining part of the grating. And this is the basic uh, test setup. You have your broadband light source. You direct it toward the grating that's put in the material that you want to see uh, experience this extreme event. And if you have a, a propellant burning or a detonation, it will chew up this length of the fiber grating. And as it chews it up, you, you have less and less light coming back. 
and your fast detector can pick up essentially what the velocity and position of the shock wave is. And I'll skip the next one. So here you have um, essentially energetic material. This is equivalent to about two hand grenades. And you can put your chirp grating through the middle of this. There's an igniter there. There's a booster. And the rest of this is the material that you're trying to check out for what its response is. The traditional way of actually making these measurements is you use piezoelectric fins. So the shock wave comes across. It hits the piezoelectric pin. It generates a voltage spike. And you know that the detonation wave has gone past that pin. And at the time we were first demonstrating it, each of those pins is roughly $100. And it gives you one point information. And our chirp grading was about $500. So instead of getting point information, when you actually detonate it, you get continuous information along the entire length which is much more valuable than just having the pin position. So this is in the center of the energetic material. You can do it on the surface, which is what that is. And maybe a little more interesting is you can look at some structure, and you can look at detonating various parts of the structure at different times, maybe demolishing a bin building or something or again, testing what the effect is of uh, energetic material. And these are traces. So you actually ignite it here. And the time of arrival at different points on that block are different. So the end result is you get something in the end that looks like that. But you can see here the block is intact. The first segment gets destroyed, the second segment the third segment, and then down here at the end. But the pins only tell you this mount, whereas this, this actually shows you what's going on in between. All right. So let's now talk about systems that could be applied to bridges or oil field applications or uh, aerospace applications, many different things. So you have these sensor strings consisting of gratings. And I've shown you some spectral approaches that support maybe 5, 10 gratings per string. There are other more sophisticated ways of doing it interferometrically where that number per string can be thousands, each one, thousands of, of, uh, of points. If you look at what it would take to have an aircraft wing, for example, and you want 3,000 sensors on that wing, and you think about taking each individual strain sensor electrically and hooking it up, you're going to have 3,000 twisted pairs going back. Whereas you can get the same 3,000 with maybe one or two, three lines of fiber that you just tack on down. So your testing co uh, costs go way down, down if you do that. But the basic principle is you have an array of, of sensors out here, grading sensors. You maybe have a switch to switch between the lines. Then you take the optical signal and you transform that optical signal into an electrical format. And then you have some sort of data formatter, transmitter. It goes off to some subsystem and then to a vehicle management bus or maybe a bridge diagnostic bus. In the aerospace case, you'd have something like this. You'd have those modules would plug into your bus, and they would take the information. You'd have processors here, which would manipulate and do things with that information from these sensors, which could be tens to hundreds to thousands. And then you start distributing the information. Now, if you've got a pilot and a plane, you might tell the pilot what's going on, but maybe there isn't time for the pilot to react. So you just forget the pilot and you go around the pilot because the pilot can't react fast enough. Or in the case of a drone or something like that, you haven't got a pilot. So in the bridge case, you might have a 1,000 bridges or 100 bridges in some metropolitan area. You loop everything back and do the same kind of thing. 
the last example of uh, single axis strain sensors. This is roof qualifying um, space shuttle tanks. They want to extend the lifetime. They have exceeded the lifetime of a lot of the space shuttle parts, including some of these, these tanks. So NASA White Sands came to us and we, we sold them a system basically that enabled arrays of fiber gratings to go over the surface of the, sh of the tanks. And then they would pressurize the tanks to failure. And we could tell them within one centimeter of where it was going to erupt because you'd get these kind of strain patterns on the surface of the pressure vessel. And you can tell, okay, it's going to fail right there. So they bought multiple systems and uh, used that for requalifying the shuttle tanks. But in a lot of cases, a single axis of strain is not good enough. Or maybe you want to measure strain in multiple dimensions plus temperature. So in order to do more than one measurement with fiber gratings, you need to do more. So I tried to figure this out at McDonnell Douglas and never came up with a real great solution. But uh, sometime later, when I started my first little company, came up with this idea. So basically, you write a grating into a special kind of fiber, which is a bioefficient fiber that actually is used for polarization maintenance. It controls polarization and fiber gyros and other types of interferometers. So if you write one grating, you have a different index of refraction along one axis than the other. That gives you two effective gratings because the period is different. The index of refraction is different. The spatial position is the same, but the index of refraction makes it look optically longer or shorter. If you load the side of this type of grating along one of these axes, it's going to move apart or together depending on which axis you load. Now suppose that you have some sort of composite vessel and there's damage, internal damage below the surface, because this is in the interior of the part. What happens then is that you don't have uniform loading across this. And the peak in the direction, in the plane corresponding to that axis is going to separate into multiple pieces. And that's an indication of damage. So we've used this for various uh, sundry um, parts. And the idea is we want to be able to take an area of the part, have gratings on both sides of them, and we have something happen to the part, and we want to know it's been damaged. And we want to be able to assess the extent of the damage. You know, is this safe to fly anymore? You know, has an aircraft wing been damaged beyond uh, uh, the point where you should use it? Or is a pressure vessel about to blow up on you because there's internal damage that's no longer as strong as you thought it was? So let's go on. Here's a pressure vessel. This is a, a brass ball, and you take it like a pendulum, and you slam it with a calibrated force onto the side of this uh, pressure vessel. On the surface, it looks like nothing has happened. But internally, there are fiber sensors, 48 of them in this case, all around the entire surface and part of the dome of this, this pressure vessel. vessel. So, so for a five-foot-pound five impact, it looks like that. You see something, something occur, 10, 15, 20. Now, now we, we could scale it so the five-pound uh, five five impact looks like that, but we wanted to show you the difference as relative to the studs. And this is a basic system that NASA Marshall bought quite a few of. Well, not too many, like three or four of us. But <coughs> if you look at this, this is a section of the pressure vessel. There are six fiber gratings. Each of these is a sector. And as the uh, impacts are occurring, what happens is that you start to see that the response of these gratings change. This is the spectral spread of each of those gratings. So you can see this one is spread the most. This is the violet one. Here's the violet. And over here 
is red, it's not spread as much. So you know, okay, this spread is more, so the damage must be in this level down here. You go to this next se sector over, you can see there's not nearly as much spread in either one of those. So you know not only is it down at this level, but it's over this way. So you can use, essentially by weighing the area under these curves, you can essentially localize the position of the damage. These are static. This is actually after it hits, the damage is induced and it's, it stays. So this is the surface and you've got all these strikes and it looks like nothing has happened. But internally, it's been damaged. Now, the traditional way of doing this, in fact, we did this with um, ATK, which is now part of Northrop Grumman, is at this time you take an ultrasound approach. And the ultrasound approach, basically, the acoustic waves go into the tank and if you have a delamination where the, the layers separate, you'll get a nice strong signal from the ultrasonic approach. You can also have situations where the, um, the tow material that did the additional front breaks apart. And you can do diagnostics on that with eddy current. The, uh, the issue there is that you're detecting only one or the other, not both. And this takes about four or five hours to stain out that tank. This approach takes you about, well, with a slow spectrometer, maybe a second, half a second to a second, to diagnose where that problem is. And with spectrometers that we have these days, it would be microseconds. So in any case, this is uh, showing you ultrasonic versus stern imaging data. That's an afternoon's worth of work. This is essentially a you know, second or two. Same thing with eddy currents. OK, another example is, is composite curing. So this is manufacturing of composites and making sure you're making them right. And there's not some residual strain buildup. In this particular case, this is just looking at six of them curing at the same time. This is the same thing, but now we're just going to look at one. And you can look at in-plane and out-of-plane response. So generally speaking, to fully cure these composite parts, you heat them up. You have maybe an, over, um, an overheating. You come back down. You have steady state heating. And eventually, you have link up. So this is the outer plane and the in plane um, residual strain internal to the part, which you can use to calculate how well that, that will work. I'm going to start cruising faster. So we've got probably another 15 minutes, I think. So in any case, this is a, a uniform fiber grading. And we're trying to measure internal strain to a complex composite part. Most composite parts or you have strength numbers in one direction, they're called quasi-isotropic. You go 45 degrees and then 45 degrees and then 45 degrees, all in one direction. Well, you can take an initial guess as to what the, the, the wavelength response is across this grating, if it's not uniform. Do a thing called a genetic algorithm where you keep changing until you, the wavelengths, until you match up with the actual spectrum. So you can see basically a convergence. This is like the first iteration eventually getting to one that, that converges to the point where they match and essentially predict what the wavelength changes across the length. Now the motivation for this, this is an Air Force Office of Scientific Research project. You can put these multi-axis gratings with one plane in and out of the composite part and these are biaxial weaves. So you have, instead of one direction, you have two dimensions. And you can have coarse weaves, and you can have fine weaves. You get the spectrum coming out. You go through this genetic algorithm to match up. And what you can get at the end is the strain distribution in the transverse uh, and also in plane directions. But here you can see for the wide weave, this is only a six millimeter 
great. Let me see if we can ignore this back end. We have a wide period, and for the narrow one, we have a narrow period. Uh, this next thing, uh, application, is uh, gluing things together rather than using rivets. Essentially, um, we did this with Boeing because they were interested in gluing uh, aircraft together, exploring that possibility. So this is aircraft aluminum on the top and the bottom. This essentially is aircraft cement with uh, spacers, little spheres built in to give you the right spacing. When you load this up, you'll get failure at the edge, and this will peel back. Because this is a multi-axis sensor, you can put on the edge of the, this, these parts at 45 degrees in the shear strain direction to uh, measure the change in strain. Now, if you go, don't go in the shear strain direction, then what happens is as you pull it, you have two peaks, but they don't move apart. They just stay the same because the maximum difference in, in change occurs in the shear strain direction. So this is increased loading, pulling it harder and harder. You see the two peaks move further and further apart. And then you can see one of the peaks splits. That's like your warning signal that, OK, this is starting to actually fall apart. And you continue to pull it, and then it explodes, and that's the end of it. All right, another example of multi-parameter sensing. We've talked about two dimensions. We can do three dimensions using two different wavelengths in, in biofringent fiber, the three axes of strain plus temperature. This is looking at pressure and temperature with a fiber grating. If you use an ordinary fiber grating and you pressurize it, and we did this with uh, Schlumberger, you pressurize the fiber to 12,000 PSI, and what hap which is equivalent to going quite a ways down in the, uh, the ground, then you get a shift in wavelength. The problem is if you shift the temperature by 50 degrees C, you get something even bigger. So that's a problem, because what you really want to do is measure pressure and temperature point to point at key locations down this oil well, or if you're doing geothermal, then a geothermal well. So as a derivative of the NASA program that we came up with the multi, demonstrated the multi-dimensional strain sensor with, I looked at side hole fiber. So this is, a, you're looking at the end of an optical fiber. This is 125 microns across. And there you can make these holes of different diameters. 30 might be typical, 30 microns. There's a core or light guiding in the middle. When you pressurize this, you seal both ends. These air holes act as buffers, like pillows, if you like. So the strain field across the core is less in this direction than in the opposite direction. So if you put this into a pressure chamber and you start loading it up, initially you have one peak. But as you increase the pressure, these will separate out. You'll have two peaks. That is pressure only. It doesn't depend on temperature at all, because the two gratings are superposed in the center of the fiber, and they're thermally matched. The entire spectrum moving back and forth is temperature. So you have pressure plus temperature. So this is data from long ago. Uh, but basically, it matches up over 75 degrees C. And you can see it's not really dependent on, on uh, temperature. And with good instruments, you just can't make any measurable difference in temperature. OK. I'm going to cruise along and finish this. Then you, you basically can multiplex different types of fiber grading sensors along a single line. For uh, power transformers, this is uh, a case where we have some transformers in the background. This is myself and my daughter installing some pressure sensors with a crew into a large transformer as it's being made. And we're measuring pressure and temperature, and we're interested also in water content. 
So that can be done for uh, large transformers. Uh, we can also do things with, um, I alluded earlier to medical applications where you can do robotic surgery, pressure measurements on the brain. There's also pressure measurements you can do in the heart. So um, this is a pretty sophisticated example, but you can actually put more than one core in an optical fiber. The idea here is you have a catheter and you want to be able to insert the catheter in the leg of the patient and you want to maneuver it all the way through the heart across a, uh, essentially a, a membrane in the middle and if the heart starts to short circuit, you want to cut that short circuit. So the catheter has an RF cutter on the end. And initially, people used these robotic um, pulleys. And the physician had to actually pull the pulleys back and forth and to try and move this thing and shape it so that you've got it to the right position. And you do it visually with x-ray fluorescence. You know, you're imaging with x-rays. This isn't good for the patient, but it was really bad for the doctors because you basically have doctors dying of cancer because they've been exposed to this continual radiation. So companies like Intuitive Surgical and Hanson Medical basically in came up with these robotically controlled pulleys that could steer it with the doctor being remote, which is kind of what I was showing you back there. The doctor could be you know, on another continent as far as that goes. But in any case, you'd like to still eliminate the uh, exposure of the patient. So uh, if you can do it with fiber and you can do shape sensing, you can actually tell what the shape is and guide this all the way to the point where you can do the cutting, corrective surgery, that would be great. And uh, I was working on this quite a bit and you can basically have several of these multi-core things and if you have frame measurements on the top and the bottom you can tell bend compression and tension and the helici helical idea uh, was mined to basically measure twist so they actually make these multi-core fibers they spin the fibers you get several cores and the big challenge for people is how do you interface all those cores because the dimensions are ridiculous the tolerances are really tight but people are working at, on this for some years and having some success, but they have a ways to go yet. Uh, last couple things, uh, crash dummies and instrumenting fiber gratings with um, strain sensors. And as the dummy in an automobile crashes, you're basically looking at where the damage is. And you can use these things potentially to support colonies on the moon and Mars for agricultural measurements, uh, electric power transmission from solar arrays, habitat, vehicles, and so on. And I'm guessing a few minutes from an hour. So I basically have gone through some examples really quick of using fiber grains to measure a bunch of parameters in many different applications. And there's all sorts of sponsors to maybe remember. These are some of the companies and organizations that have sponsored uh, some of the work that we've done. And that's one collection. Here's another collection. And for references, um, I have a fiber optic sensor book sitting here in chapter 15 basically covers most of the stuff that I've talked about. There's a third edition that I submitted before I left for Finland, like the day before I left for Finland, that may be out at the end of this year or beginning of next year that covers the rest of it. And I'd like to thank uh, Dormi and uh, Sturi for <laughs> essentially getting me here. <laughs> uh, without them, I probably would not be in Finland at this moment, but I had to put it my own way. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
and we are very glad to have you here and are happy to host you uh, next uh, year again. Uh, and uh, I think we can have some questions from the audience, if there are any. So about the strain gauge, uh, do I understand correctly that the uh, uh, limit of um, how much uh, of strain you can actually measure is determined by the material from which the uh, fiber is made? Yes, yes. The, um, typically, you don't want to go above 3 to 5 percent. What they do is when you make optical fiber, you usually qualify it in terms of three psi. So, mm -hmm. well, that's uh, and there's English units, but 100 k psi corresponds to one percent elongation. If you can get fiber qualified to three or four hundred k psi, so that's the usual limit on silica-based fiber. There are um, plastic fibers that have much greater elongation, but you worry about uh, silicon dioxide, you know, you're very certain it's gonna come back. You know, it's, it's almost like a crystalline material and the purity of it is very, very high. For, so for precision measurements, you need to use something like that material. But if you're only concerned about, well, you know, is it going 10, 15%, then some people have experimented with plastic and I've tried that too, and I wasn't happy. <laughs> so you're, you're limited in that respect. Yeah, so plastic deformation factors of the material. It's, it's a big problem. Uh, is there any kind of way with uh, uh, using, uh, you know, kind of composite approach? Uh, you, you mentioned that you, you had to coat some of the fibers to... Uh, Yes, the, it, so if you use a coating, in fact, that's key to trying to get longer and longer lengths. Uh, so the kind of coating you use can actually enhance the strength of the fiber. And the, the issue, there's a bunch of issues, some of which I haven't really addressed. Mm, one, terrible. One is, uh, if you don't coat the fiber properly and you have a fracture on the surface, it will over time propagate. So how much load you have on the fiber, and if you have any of these cracks, you didn't make it completely properly, you didn't coat it properly, that can be a lifetime limitation. The other thing I should mention is that um, there are different ways of making fiber gratings, for example. Some of the me mechanisms where you use femtosecond pulses to actually generate those refractive index changes are good all the way to the melting point of the fiber, which is about 1,060 or so. They, you start to have some softening, that's a problem. But, and that's okay for a temperature sensor, but if you start to actually use strain measurements at those elevated temperatures, something like about 800 to 900, if you're doing a lot of repetitions, becomes an issue. People have used these at cryogenic temperatures um, well, we use it at liquid hydrogen type temperatures, but at CERN, they're actually using liquid helium temperatures. And some really strange stuff happens when you get to very close to absolute zero. But people have actually characterized it, and you, could, you can actually do it all the way from close to absolute zero. For silicon dioxide, you can do it all the way to around 800, and we've used sapphire, which is 2,000 degrees C melting point instead of more like 1,100. So if you want to extend way up, you have to use different materials, but the problem is you have this huge tens of billions of dollars of R&D per year being spent at the telecom, so you get really low cost, really cheap optical fiber from them Sapphire stuff is only made for us. <laughs> and it's really expensive and it's really bad. I mean, it works, but it's, it's pushing whether it's usable in a lot of cases. All right. Thank you for a very fascinating conversation, uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
Are there any more questions? Yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so one thing, there is the, pro the gratings and the parameters for the gratings, and you can play with them. And the other thing is about the uh, fiber itself, whether it's a plastic, glass fiber, the core thickness, the hollow uh, fibers, and so on. So is it more important, or do you play with both the grating parameters and, and the, uh, the fiber itself? Well, you asked for the view of both. So the, the fiber itself is important. It, it kind of gives you some fundamental limits on this, on softening and, uh, and temp uh, temperature ranges. You know, if it gets too hot, it, it, it no longer functions. But <coughs> the gratings, there are different types of grating fabrication techniques. And the lower ones is like continuous exposure to uh, UV light. And usually with a laser, it's either interferometrically uh, applied or you have, well, you have a phase mask which de facto generates uh, um, interference pattern. Generally, if you make those, you have to go through a, a number of processing steps if you make it with a long exposure time. It turns out that you have to preload the fiber itself with hydrogen to get more durability at the higher temperatures and you have to anneal them because what happens is you get overexposure and between the gritting lines you have an increase in the mixed ore fraction which will give you a false reading and if the temperature is high enough it will start washing that out and you'll get things that have nothing to do with the measurement. So the procedure on how you make the gritting and the procedures and how you make the fiber and, and the coatings, and they, they all come together. It's, it's a multi-dimensional problem. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think there are no more questions in the audience, but um, uh, I hope that your stay here will uh, help guide the Finnish industries to reach new subtleties. So um, uh, I think our next uh, speakers can elaborate on that one a bit more. Uh, we have uh, Photonics Finland here, Juha Pulmonen, and uh, Jarl Jyrki Saarinen. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Juha Problem. I'm the Executive Director of Photonics Finland. And I shortly today shall go through about the industry in Finland related to photonics. Give some numbers and then uh, introduce you very shortly about the Photonics Finland itself. And then my colleague Jyrki Saarinen will talk about more about the future and future uh, technologies. OK, let's start. Um, in Finland, we have at the moment 300 companies who are pure with photonics or their business related very much about the photonics. Uh, this is the uh, survey in, in this uh, spring. So three years ago, uh, we had 260 companies and 2016, we have 200 companies. So the growth is, is quite nice, quite heavy. And the, the reason is that there is coming all the time the new startups. The universities and the National Research Center uh, uh, producing all the time the new companies related to photonics based on the high level uh, research. And also the companies who are already existing. So they are start using the photonics. So the photonics will become very crucial technology in their business. Same about the revenue, 
and the industry, so how much money the companies are doing. So at the moment, the Finland uh, photonics is producing 2 billion euros. It's quite nice and relevant uh, business at the moment already. It's growing very heavily. For example, in 2016, the, the same number was uh, 0.8 uh, billion. So the growth is quite heavy. At the same time, because the photonics is growing all the time, companies are starting using the photonics all the time. So the more and more employees are working in photonics. So at the moment, uh, 6,000 employees are working in photonics in Finland. So this is a quite, quite nice number at the moment. So I uh, give you some uh, uh, facts and information behind of those numbers. So the, uh, the basically, this is very typically in Finland, uh, in, in, in photonics, so that mainly they are small companies. They are niche companies are focusing some, some point inside the photonics. But of course, the large companies, they are, they are more employees working in photonics. So this is a, that kind of uh, combination. Uh, the photonics is a uh, key enabling technology, and it's used in the different industry sector. Same in Finland. So there, the photonics are used in different uh, se uh, industry sector the, uh, in, in Finland, but also the similar way in, in Europe. And it's growing all the time. So the crucial of the photonics importance is more and more. Um, in Finland, especially, I think that this is a little bit surprising because we are still producing the photonics. So we are producing the, some optical components, lasers, and other uh, photonics-based components. So we really manufacturing of those. And then there is also the industry and companies who are uh, producing the systems based on the photonics. So this is, a, I think that this is a good thing and give a po possibility to grow and continue the growth in, in Finland about the photonics. This is quite interesting. So probably you can, cannot see at least here in the audience, but uh, it tells that uh, where the money coming from the companies. And, and it means that how much export the companies are doing. So in the below, there is that ba basically purely the business is inside the Finland, and the, the top of the over there is basically all of the business coming from export. And it's quite interesting that there is a basically purely inside the Finland or purely just the export. And when we go a little bit deeper, so there is a lot of uh, supplier in, in big industry in Finland. For example, when they are manufacturing the paper machine, so there is a lot of photonics components, and there is a supplier for those big industry based on the photonics. The most important part where the uh, Finnish photonics companies are exporting is in Europe, and inside the New Europe there is a Germany. And everybody knows that Germany is very strong in photonics, so I think that this also show that the photonics in Finland is quite uh, uh, well known and uh, companies would like to use the high level photonics what is producing inside the Finland. Other growing uh, area is US. So I think that this also helps a lot when Finland is now the NATO. So it helps also this aerospace, uh, defense and other activities related to photonics. And the growth. So it seems at least the companies, they believe that the growth is continuing. So that sense, it is a quite nice situation in Finland that we have a already quite good uh, industry in photonics, but it seems that it's still growing very heavily. And the one reason why we are here now in, in here in Vasa, because there is a very strong energy cluster. So I believe that also the photonics is key enabling technology in the energy sector. Many times, because the photonics is very large, so there is a lot of applications, there is a lot of technology behind of that. And many people are asking that where the Finland is especially good, and 
as you know that when, when Finnish says that we are very good, so it means that we are uh, one of the leading, leading country in that sector. So we can say that we have optical sensing and imaging. So there is a lot of heritage of Nokia. So this, this gives a long history of this technology. Then the micro and nanophotonics, and then laser and fiber optics. And newest one is this virtual reality and extended reality and, and augmented reality application related, of course, to photonic space. So in Finland, Photonics Finland is the association which organizes the activities in Finland. This is a speak behalf of photonics, introducing the possibilities, generating the network, uh, developing the cluster, and helping the companies, especially the companies who don't have a photonics experience, to get known uh, companies who can help them. At the moment, Photonics Finland, we have 118 uh, company members, including also the universities, who will have a photonics education and research. And this is a growing all the time, and especially those companies who are start using the photonics are joining the Photonics Finland. We are also the contact point to foreign companies and foreign clusters to Finnish photonics ecosystem. And this is a, just an example about the collaboration because the photonics is starting to use in, uh, in many phase. So there is a photonics center, which is co a collaboration between the universities, the companies, which can help the company to get photonics uh, knowledge. Not only the knowledge, knowledge but, but there is also the equipment because equipment are very important in photonics field. So, so there is a the common use uh, equipments, the, the property are very expensive, so then it's very nice to companies that they can get the good uh, equipments in very low cost and then start using that and it helps them uh, uh, the business. There is the facilities, there is the services, very easy to access the rich university research, get the people because the university is educating the people, it's very easy to get the knowledge people from the photonics. So this is just the example when we are going to in the future. So I think that we continue next about the future uh, possibilities in photonics, especially in Finland, and I give a talk to my colleague Juri Saari. Okay, thank, thank you, and good, good afternoon from my side, side also. So, so, like you have said, my name is Jürgen Sainen, and I'm a professor and focus on, on photonics applications and commercialization. So let's take one step towards uh, the, this universal research, but this is the example that we're doing. So uh, the Finnish government launched a new program called Flagship in the 2018. And the idea is that, that we okay, we should have a high, high, ex high quality uh, research in Finland. But besides that, we should have more and more such kind of research that has an impact on our society. What, what does impact mean? It means that it generates economic growth for the company, number of uh, employees, and, and, and who you can say is bringing money to the, to the, to, to the society but also solves economic problems, solves societal problems, because we know that we have a lot of challenges now ahead about the climate change and, and, and so on. So then um, uh, there are now uh, six plus four, so ten flagships, which are important, not only because of the research, but also for the impact for the future of Finland. And one of them is uh, the photonics. Uh, Photonics Research and Innovation, and it's, it's a collaboration between the University of Tampere, Aalto University, VTT, and then the University of Eastern Finland, where I'm coming from. And why? Because there are so many different type of applications for the light, which we already heard from you in the very beginning, and I could spend hours and, and days for telling you more. Unfortunately, I don't have time for that today. But anyway, what we are doing in this train flagship is that that uh, we are we have these four partners like I said three universities and one research uh, institute we have about more than 400 scientists working on photonics 
and they are working on, on various kind of fields in, 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 the, in the bottom. So, and, and of course, the case, the energy is one of the areas. And it's, it's, glo it's internationally spread very, very well, so we have countries uh, from all down to Helsinki, uh, uh, from Tampere to Kuopio and beyond too. So it's, it's really a big pro uh, program where we are trying to, what we are doing there is that we are working on different kind of materials because office that need uh, glass or whatever kind of materials we heard about important for offices, uh, uh, for fiber optics and other materials. So about the materials, we are developing graphene technology, graphene materials, semiconductor materials, nanomaterials. Think about the structures. So the light uh, 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 touches the, the material, uh, the different kind of components. It's about the interaction between the light and the structures. We are developing those. For the materials and components, uh, structures, we can make components. So eyeglasses are very good to optics. Uh, uh, fiber uh, optics is much more complicated. And there are many kind of a case, things what we can do. And then, of course, we can, from the components, we can build systems, and there we are studying those. And for example, the, the two first application areas where all our, our, of our partners are collaborating are 3D lidars, for example, for test driving vehicles, but then sensors, and then also photovoltaics, so solar cells. And then we are also working with the industry, clo very closely with the industry, and also Photonic Finland is one of the key partners for that. And the societal challenges where we want to find solutions, where we want to offer solutions, energy, health, environment, it's about those things, for example. This is uh, from my university, so I'm coming from the University of Eastern Finland, where we have this good center for photonic sciences, it's an umbrella organization. We have uh, scientists actually in five different departments, so people from physics background, biology background, chemistry background, computer science, and, and so on. And we have about 150 people working there, plus a, a master of science students, 23 professors. And this is just quickly their name and, and the fields they are working from the fundamental of photonics to the manufacturing of optics and various kind of applications. And then just two examples about the energy because we are here in, in Vasa today. So again, I could spend a uh, long time for different, different kind of uh, ideas of applications and so on, but let's take two examples. One thing is about the solar energy. So this is a very unfortunate thing to finish, but uh, this gives you an idea about the potential of the energy sources. And if you look about this, the size of these circles is about the amount. And, and you can see that sun is really the, the winner. So the amount of, of energy that is available on Earth from sun is huge. We are just not able to use it properly. And of course, where we have sun, uh, we, don't, we should also have the, the way to collect and uh, store that. So, the, so the, together with the source and uh, is also the battery technology is very important. But anyway, this gives you an idea about the potential where we can get the energy today. People are saying that, for example, even today, because the uh, one thing, the efficiency of solar cells is still not good, or it's, it's good 20%, but there's still much more room to take, uh, take advantage of the energy. But anyway, even if we would have those, those solar cells and we would cover the Finland size area in Sahara desert in, in northern North Africa. That would be enough for the for the energy for the whole globe today. So and, and there would be definitely a space for that. The only thing is of course how to transport the energy to everywhere in the world, how to store that and so on. But anyway, we can get the amount of energy free of charge from sun. Then the other one is just an example, one, one uh, uh, startup company. So it's about the, about the photonics in, in battery industry. So there are new innovations, how to do online monitoring. For example, if we, if we, want, to, uh, uh, if we want to find the, the battery metals 
when we have the mines, and then also we, what, when we need to recycle, for example, for the lithium uh, ion uh, uh, batteries, because we know that these are rare, met, uh, rare uh, uh, metals, and, and there will be a lack of that. So the important for recycling and, and monitoring the processes online is important. And today, with the old existing technologies, we can only do that in the lab. So we take the sample, we bring them to the central uh, laboratory, wait for a couple of hours. With the new novel photonics measurement systems, we can get a result in less than five minutes online. So that was about uh, uh, briefly about the, the possibilities that we hope to start learning, uh, learning now with the energy sector, also with the battery sector and so on. Of course, we want to continue the work with all the other sectors. Uh, just beside the, uh, the table there, when you go out, there's a, there are two brochures. The photonics in, in Finland brochure, which you can take, it's also now, uh, you can download also online. So it gives a good, good an opportun, uh, overview about the, all the photonics in Finland. We published that just in June, so it's a very fresh publication. And the other one, small brochure, is about this uh, from the uh, Photonics Center. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions for uh, Photonics Finland? Or uh, any further questions for uh, Mr. Eric Ud? If not, then I would like to thank you all for participating. And I hope to see you all uh, throughout the event. Uh, it's a very exciting week. Mm. And uh, the second part of the Photonics session is on Friday. So make sure to be there or here. Um, I think we are good. Thank you.